For the next two Sundays, I would like to talk about the topic of approval, commendation, and praise of men. I want to give you an overview of the topic, first of all, to show you what I want to cover over the next couple of Sundays, and give you the purpose of the study, which is to give a balanced view of this subject of approval, commendation, and praise of men. A lot of people, Christians probably, if you heard the phrase, the praise of men, I could be wrong, but I would think that most of you would receive that in a negative connotation. You'd think, you know, woe unto you when all men speak well of you, and and we shouldn't be praised of men, and we should only be concerned about the praise of God. And if that's what you think the sermon's going to be about, then you're only half right, because there is an aspect of the praise of men that is not good, but there's also an aspect of the praise of men that is good, and that should be done. And that's what I want to talk about. Uh, The approval, commendation, and praise of men is a good thing when it's deserved. That's a key point there, when it's deserved. It is not a good thing if it's undeserved or if the character or work being praised is not good in the sight of God. So if you flat out just did a bad job, you don't deserve to be praised or commended. Or if you did a good job, it's something you shouldn't have done. It's unbiblical, you shouldn't be praised for that either, and I'll talk about that. The praise of men, commendation, approval, should not be sought after or coveted. So while it is good to be praised, if you have done well, you shouldn't desire it and covet it. Okay, that's another big part of this. It should also not be expected. So if you've done well, you shouldn't expect people to praise you. If they do, that's nice, but you shouldn't expect it. It also should not be withheld from those who deserve it. And that's the other side of the coin. The first side of the coin is, and I'm going to actually cover these in reverse order in the sermon. I don't know why I listed them in this order. But the first side of the coin is that we shouldn't expect and covet the praise of men and live for it. But the other side of the coin is we shouldn't withhold it from other people who deserve it. And I dare say that probably all of us do err in both of these things, from time to time at least. And then the approval, commendation, and praise of God should be far more important to us than the praise of men. And that would be the last thing that I want to talk about. So I will cover, like I said, in the first part of the series today, it's a good thing to be praised when it's deserved. It's not a good thing when it's undeserved or it's not something praiseworthy, and we ought to uh, not withhold praise when it's due. And then next Sunday, I'll talk about how it should not be sought after or coveted, should not be expected, and that we should ultimately seek to have God's praise and not the praise of men. So if I could just sum up the sermon very succinctly, there are two things that I want to reprove mainly, and there will be other things covered, but two things to reprove. First of all, seeking and expecting praise, and second of all, withholding it from those that deserve it. Those are both errors, and like I said, I think we've all been guilty of both of these things, uh, at least from time to time. I know that I have. So let me define some terms here for you before I go further. Again, I'm going to define the first term here, which has to do with approval. I'm going to define it in reverse order. I apparently liked putting things out of order in the outline for some reason and then realizing it after the fact. But uh, Approval is the action of approving, sanctioning, approbation. To approve is to make good a statement or position, to show to be true, prove, demonstrate. And then as, we, as it is used, as we're, as we're going to look at usages of the Bible and it, it would be to pronounce, to be good, or to commend. So to approve could simply mean to prove something to be true, but that's not how I'm using it in the sermon, and that's not, in in some of the cases in the Bible anyway, that's not how it's being used either. It's being used in this other sense, to pronounce, to be good, or commend. And then approved, the adjective of the past participle, is proved or established by experience, tested, or tried, tested, and then, as as we're going to be using it in the study, pronounced good, justified, sanctified, commended, esteemed. Now we saw that to approve is to commend, and to commend is to give in trust or charge, deliver to one's care or keeping, to commit and trust. 
Now, the scripture does use the word in that sense. That's the first primary sense. When Jesus said, into thy hands commend I my spirit, when he was hanging on the cross, it was in that sense that he was giving his spirit, he was entrusting his spirit and his soul to God. That's not how I'm using it in the sermon today. That's not how the, some of the verses that we're going to be looking at are using it. So they're using it in, in this secondary sense. And that is to present as worthy or favorable acceptance, regard, consideration, attention, or notice, to direct attention to, as worthy of notice or regard, to recommend, to mention as worthy of acceptance or approval, to express approbation of praise, extol. So that's in the way that it's going to be used in this study and in the verses that we're going to look at. Uh, commendation, the noun form of commend, is, again, the first one would be like the first one of command, giving in charge and trusting committal. Secondly, it is the expression of approval, recommendation, recommendation of a person to the favorable notice or attention of another, also in the phrase letter of commendation. Paul actually talks about letters of commendation, uh, uses almost that exact phrase, uh, as I remember, and we'll look at that verse later. I think that'll be next Sunday. And then to commend was to recommend. And to recommend is almost the same thing. Uh, it's very similar in definition. It is to commend or commit one's, one's self or another, one's soul or spirit, to God, his keeping, etc. So you see that the definition, the first definition of command, commendation, recommend, they all have to do with giving it in safekeeping to somebody else to keep. Uh, that's not how we're using it in this study. Uh, number three is to praise, commend a person. Five is to mention or introduce a thing with approbation or commendation to a person in order to induce acceptance or trial. And then recommendation is the action of recommending oneself to another's remembrance, a message of this nature, similar to the first definition of the other words we looked at. Uh, thirdly, it's commendation, favor, repute, esteem. Fourthly, the action of recommending a person or thing as worthy or desirable, which is how we usually think of it being used. Also, that which is recommended a proposal or suggestion. And then praise. I think praise came up there in one of these definitions. Yeah, it did in the to command was to express approbation over praise, etc. Uh, praise is the, the noun, is the action or fact of praising, the expression in speech of estimation or honor, commendation of the worth or excellence of a person or thing, eulogy, laud, laudation. And praise the verb is to tell, proclaim, or commend the worth, excellence, or merits of, to express warm approbation of, speak highly of, to laud, extol. And this is the leading current sense that the dictionary says. So you'll notice that all of those words, approve in its cognates, commend in its cognates, recommend in its cognates, and praise, they all essentially talk about the same thing. They mean the same thing. They're very similar. So with all that in front of us now, let's look at what the scripture has to say about this topic. I hope I didn't put you to sleep with all those definitions, but the definitions are important. So first of all, it's not necessarily wrong to receive approval or commendation or praise of men. Like I said, the praise of men is not necessarily a bad thing, and I will prove this to you with the scripture. For instance, if you have served Christ in a way that is acceptable with God and men approve of you for it, that's fine. As a matter of fact, that's a good thing. Let's look at Romans 14 and verse 18. So if you're ever commended, if you're ever praised, if you're ever recommended, you don't automatically want to think that's a bad thing. You need to ask who's doing it and what are they praising and why are they praising. Right? You want to ask those questions. And then you want to figure out if it's legit and valid or not. Accept it if it is. Just forget about it if it's not. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Uh, Romans 14 and verse 18. This chapter is about Christian liberty. Some people, Paul talks about, are weak and they only eat herbs. Some people are strong and they eat meat. 
Some people esteem one day above another. Some people esteem every day alike and they don't make anything special out of any days and things like that. And he goes on to say, and he teaches there, that we shouldn't judge people if they only want to eat herbs, let them eat herbs. If your brother wants to eat meat and you don't think that's right, well, you don't judge him for it because God says it's fine. right? So, in areas of Christian liberty, if you do well and you, you obey what the Scripture says and you don't judge people who aren't supposed to be judged and you show tolerance to people and you show Christian love, then this is what Paul says. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. So you're approved or accepted by God and men if you do this. It's not a bad thing. Not a bad thing to be approved of men when you've done what is right and good and biblical. Let me give you another example of how it's not wrong to be commended or recommended uh, by men. The Apostle Paul, when he was giving instruction to the church in Corinth about the collection that they had taken up that was for the poor saints in Jerusalem. There was a dearth, a drought, a famine in Jerusalem. And he had the other church, some of the other churches, like the church in Corinth and the church in uh, Achaia. And um, there was other ones too uh, that escaped my, my memory right now. He had them take up a collection. And he needed to have somebody trustworthy take that money and take it to Jerusalem. He didn't want somebody that was untrustworthy. He didn't want a Judas Iscariot or something taking the money and, and you know, squandering it, pillaging it or something. So he told them, the church in Corinth, that they would approve somebody by letters and that that person, whoever they approved, would take the money to Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 3. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters... Then will I ascend to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. You know what he's telling them? Give a letter of recommendation to a, a person that's a good man, a trustworthy man. Write a letter of recommendation to me, and I'm going to take that recommendation and take your word for it, and he's going to be the one that takes this money to Jerusalem. There's nothing wrong with letters of recommendation. I have received letters of recommendation in my life. I have written letters of recommendation for other people in my life. There's nothing wrong with that. This is a prime example of it. Being commended and praised for being good or doing well is a good thing. Let me give you a verse I thought about. I thought about a number of verses this morning or yesterday evening as I was looking at this that aren't in the outline. I might add them in later, but... Uh, turn to Proverbs 27, 2. You will recognize this verse surely when you see it. But I'm using it in a different way than I've ever used it before. I will use it in the way that we always use it later. But I want you, I'm just going to draw your attention to something here that I just thought about, like this morning or yesterday. It says, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, not thine own lips. Now, I always use that verse to say you shouldn't praise yourself, you should wait for somebody else to praise you, right? Praising yourself is an act of pride. It's stupid. It's foolish. And you look dumb. You shouldn't do that, right? But I just noticed it says, let another man praise thee. So what's that mean? It means if somebody wants to praise you, let him praise you. If somebody praises you, you don't have to say, oh, no, no, no. Do not pray. Don't tell me I did a good job. You don't have to do that. If somebody praises you and it's legitimate, I'll talk about that in a minute. In a minute, let them praise you. It's a good thing if you've done well or done good. But here's the thing: you don't want to refuse the praise, but you want to prove the praise. You want to see if the praise is legitimate. Proverbs twenty-seven and verse twenty-one: As the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. A finding pot in a furnace heats up gold and silver and it burns off the dross. The dross rises to the top to get rid of the dross. That's all the, extemp all the extraneous junk in it, all the other impurities. And all that stuff comes off when it gets heated up. And what's left is the pure gold and the pure silver. So is a man to his praise. A man receives praise of men and he's like that furnace. And that praise enters into him and it gets heated up. And he separates 
the silver and gold from the dross. And he looks at that praise and says, is this guy flattering me? Is he telling me, is he singing my praises when I know that I'm not, what I did wasn't that great? Is he, is he just trying to get on my good side? Is he buttering me up? Is he lying to me? Is he trying to, you know, to somehow take advantage of me? Or is what I did really, is he just, does he think I did something great, but I really know that I really didn't? You know, it wasn't really that, that great. It wasn't done for good motives. Something like that. You refine your praise. Or you realize, you know, should he even be praising for me, me that in the first place? Yeah, I did a good job at that, but now I realize I shouldn't have even done it in the first place. Right? A man refines his praise. He burns off the dross, and if he finds out he's being flattered or that it's incorrect praise or unworthy or undue praise, he just casts that off and doesn't even doesn't take it. That's what a good man does. A fool takes it all and loves it. And he loves the flattery. Fools love to be flattered. Love to be told how wonderful they are. However, though it's a good thing to be praised for doing good or doing well, and those are not the same thing. I might talk about that in a second. Doing good and doing well are two totally different things. Doing good is doing the right thing. Doing well is doing the right or wrong thing efficiently. Doing well is is fine if you're doing good. But doing well is not fine if you're not doing good. However, receiving men's approval doesn't necessarily mean that one is right in the eyes of God. Let's look at Psalm 49 and verse 13. Just because you receive the praise of men does not mean you have done right. And you should not take that as an automatic rubber stamp from God that you have done right just because men praise you and men tell you you've done a good job. Because men in this world especially are screwed up and their priorities are usually 180 degrees. So if you're being praised of men in this world for something you have done, you definitely need to refine that praise because chances are they think things that God doesn't think are good are good. Right? They see people doing things that are unbiblical and ungodly and they sing their praises like they are this wonderful person. They've done these wonderful things and God says, I hate that. I hate that. That doesn't impress me a bit. Psalm 49 and verse 13. Think about how many fornicators, just to give you one obvious example, how many fornicators have babies today and men praise them and Tell them how happy they are and how wonderful this is and how beautiful your child is and all this stuff. I've seen it happen. God hates it. It's filthy and disgusting and yet men praise it and love it. Think about that. Psalm 49 and verse 13. This, just to give you some background, this this psalm is about evil rich men. Rich men that trust in their riches and their wealth. Okay, you can read the, the psalm to get the whole context here. But it's talking about these people that trust in their wealth. And they think it's going to last forever. And of them it is said, in verse 13, This their way is their folly, yet their posterity, that is their children, approve their sayings. Selah. Oh yeah, they're approved of their children and their grandchildren. Their, their family all think they're wonderful. And yet, and yet God says, their way is folly. So they're approved of men and rejected of God. See, these approved of men and approved by God don't necessarily always go together. As a matter of fact, often they don't. Down in verse 18, Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. They will. When you do well, and in this context, doing well to thyself means getting wealth and being wealthy and rich, oh, men will praise you for that. They will. They're very, most men are very impressed by people that have wealth. And if that wealth was earned and deserved and the person that has it is humble, I'm impressed with it too. I'm impressed with anybody that, that starts a business and does really well for himself and, and makes a fortune. I'm, I'm super impressed by that if it's done well and good and for the right reasons and with the right attitude and giving God the glory and all those kind of things. Yeah, I'm impressed by that too. But yes, men will praise thy, they'll praise you when you do well for yourself. And he's talking about people that have done well for themselves, except they're wicked men that trust in their wealth, not in God. Let me just give you some other examples here of how 
the praise of men doesn't necessarily mean that you're right in the eyes of God. Uh, Luke 6 and verse 26. As a matter of fact, if it comes from the men of this world, I would say just default assume that it, what you've done is probably not right in the eyes of God. If it comes from men that have no faith, ungodly men, assume that you have done the wrong thing and then maybe they, this guy actually, a blind squirrel, stumbled upon a nut and maybe he's actually praising you for something that's good. But if it's from a person of this world, just assume you've done wrong and then go from there. Uh, Luke 6 and verse 26, Jesus said, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. If your idea is, well, everybody thinks I'm doing the right thing, everybody's telling me what a great guy I am, everybody's telling me how pleased and happy they are with me, and I mean everybody, I mean it doesn't matter who they are, I mean the drunk down the street, everybody thinks I'm a great guy. You're probably not a great guy. More than likely. Because if all men speak well of you, you're probably not following Christ very closely. Because when you follow Christ very closely and people find out about it and you start refusing to do what they want you to do and you start condemning things that others are doing that are wrong and not voicing your approval to it, men aren't all going to like you. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 16 and verse 15? Luke 16 and verse 15. I know that's a risk that I run because, you know, over the last six years I've met a lot of people here. I've got to know people. I've made friends with people that are, you know... Anyway, that doesn't matter. So, but I realize that eventually somebody's going to stumble across my website and somebody's going to hear the sermons that I preach and somebody's going to find out about the things that I believe and all of a sudden... Maybe a lot of the friends that I've made are going to kind of ooh, back off a little bit. I don't, I don't know if I want to be associated with this guy because I didn't know he didn't celebrate Christmas. I didn't know he believes that God chooses some and not others. I didn't know he's, he's not a Zionist. I didn't know he's, he's not in favor of the, you know, Israel's slaughter of the Palestinians or whatever. I, I didn't know this and that and the other thing, right? I didn't know he preaches against sodomites and fornicators and I didn't know any of that. So I realized that my days could be numbered as far as having friends in this town outside the church. Hopefully not, but I know it could happen very easily because I, you know, it's all out there. It's all out there for them to hear. But I guess I'll just enjoy it while I have it. Anyway, Luke 16 and verse 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. You find something that men universally love, and I'll show you something that probably God hates. Example, Christmas. Don't men love Christmas? Everybody loves Christmas. Whether you're a professing Christian or an atheist or uh, people of other non-Christian religions, pretty much everybody loves Christmas. And that should tell you something about it. That should tell you something about it. And then one more, John 15 and verse 19. John 15, 19. If ye were of the world, Jesus said to his disciples, the world would love his own, but because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. See, Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But if you're not of the world, they're going to hate you. So, if you get the approval of men, it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean you're right in the eyes of God. Like I said, it just depends on who is praising you, what they're praising you for, and why they are praising you. And that's what you have to figure out. Now, it is good to commend people or their work to others when it's deserved. It's not a bad thing to commend and praise other people as long as it's deserved and as long as you're doing it with a pure heart and not to flatter them and not to get some advantage over them. I'll talk about flattery later. 
Let me give you a couple of examples of this. When Paul was choosing somebody to go on an evangelistic trip with him, I believe this was after uh, John Mark had departed the work and Paul wanted to leave him behind, Barnabas wanted to take him, and they had such a contention that they decided to part company, that is, Paul and Barnabas, and so Paul was going to take somebody else with him. And he ended up taking Silas because Silas was recommended to him under the grace of God. Let's look at Acts 15 and verse 40. Acts 15 and verse 40. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. Again, just like when Paul chose the guy to take the money from Corinth to Jerusalem because the brethren recommended him, the same reason, uh, for the same reason, Paul to took and chose Silas to go with him on this trip because the brethren recommended him unto the grace of God. Or, I think you could say, unto the gospel of the grace of God. They recommended him as a good companion to go with Paul to preach the gospel and to evangelize. So, again, Paul here basically takes a letter of recommendation. I don't know if they wrote it or not, but either a letter or a word of recommendation from the brethren and an axe on it. Paul was not against writing letters of recommendation or commending somebody for something that they have done. Paul himself commended Phoebe to the saints in Rome, praising her and asking them to receive her. Let's look at Romans 16, 1 through 2. Romans 16, 1 through 2. Paul says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sencria, that ye receive her in the Lord, as become a saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer, which means a helper, of many, and of myself also. He commended her, or recommended her. He praised her work, in other words, and he told them to receive her and help her with whatever she needs. You know what he did? He literally wrote a letter of commendation for Phoebe. He wrote a letter. It's called the Book of Romans. And the first two verses of chapter 16 are a letter of commendation for Phoebe. There's nothing wrong with writing a letter of commendation for somebody. Now let's talk about the desire to be approved of and praised. It is a natural desire. It's natural to want to be approved of or commended or praised by others. So the desire is natural, but how you react to it is what can get you into trouble. Right? It's not wrong to desire something, but if you start to covet it, like you really want it and you're going to do whatever you have to to get it, or you're just going to take it into your own hands and start commending yourself and praising yourself and things like that, that's when you get into trouble. But the simple human desire to be approved of, to be commended, to be praised, that is a natural human desire. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that desire. There, is there anything wrong with the desire to satisfy your hunger and eat? No. Is there anything wrong with eating blood to satisfy that hunger? Yes. Is there anything wrong with eating to the point of gluttony? Yes. Is there anything wrong with drinking a glass of wine to uh, quench your thirst? No. Is there anything wrong with drinking a gallon of wine? Yes. Right. So the desire to fulfill some need is not necessarily wrong. It's how you do it, right, and the motive behind it, and things like that. When a man thinks that his work is worthy of being commended by others, whether it is or not and others fail to do so, he will be tempted or even feel compelled to boast of it himself. And this is not a good thing. 2 Corinthians 12.11 I don't exactly know what to make of this passage because honestly I think Paul is kind of admitting a fault here, it, it seems to me. I mean, he, he was a man just like the rest of us, right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 11 Paul says, I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. 
it sounds like to me saying, you know what, you should have commended me. I, I am one of the best apostles. I am highly qualified here. And you haven't done it, so I've become a fool in glorying, and I've told you what, how great I am. I mean, that's what it sounds like he's saying to me. I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but um, even, even if that wasn't what he is specifically saying, that very principle applies to men. That's what happens. If a man feels that his work was good and commendable, and he doesn't get commended for it, then a lot of men will take matters into their own hands and they will become fools and glorying and they will commend their own work and they will praise themselves. And that's not a good thing. So, you know, you want to be careful about withholding commendation from somebody who has truly done good work because you don't want to give him a stumbling block to where he's just so frustrated by nobody noticing that he takes it into his own hands and acts like a fool. Right? He shouldn't do that, but then again, we shouldn't withhold commendation from somebody who has done good work either. And I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Now, having a longing to be commended by others is a natural human desire, but we must never let that desire cause us to commend ourselves or our work to others, nor to become resentful of those who don't commend us or our work. See, there's two main main things that can happen, two bad things. You can either start praising yourself, which is bad, or you can become resentful of those who don't praise you, and that's probably even worse. You, you definitely don't want to do that, because resentment and bitterness will be a root springing up in you, and many will be defiled. And Paul talks about that in Hebrews chapter... Let's see, is it chapter... I know where it is on the page. Uh, chapter Is it chapter 12? It's chapter 12 and uh, verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up in you, or springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So you don't ever want that root of bitterness or resentment to start building and you just think, oh, I just did a really good job, and my boss didn't even recognize it. He didn't even say that I did a good job. He didn't say anything about it. I just put all that work, all that overtime into it. I did so much, and he didn't even recognize me. That can hurt. But to start praising your own work or to resent that boss in your heart, those are bad things. You don't want to do that. We all need to guard against something like that. Now let's talk about not getting the praise and approval from parents that we long for. And I think this explains why a lot of people are screwed up. This explains why a lot of people have psychological and emotional problems. It's because they did not get the praise and approval of their parents that they so desired. That's not the reason why everybody's screwed up, but I think that has a lot to do with a lot of problems that people have. I believe that this is a driving force in many people's lives which makes them constantly strive to be recognized and praised. You ever meet somebody like that? I mean, we all like to be recognized and praised, right? But have you ever met somebody that you can just see it in their actions, that that is what they want from everybody? They are just screaming out in a, lip, in a figurative sense, screaming out for praise and approval and acceptance. And their whole life is focused on that. Everything that person does is to try to get the recognition of men, to try to get somebody to recognize him, to praise him, to tell him he did a good job. You ever met people like that? I have. And you know what I think is the cause of that in many cases? He did not get the praise and approval of his parents, probably specifically his father, when he was growing up. Why do you think there are some people out there that want to get the big house, the nice cars, the nice vehicles, you know, have their children on the honor roll and then put the bumper sticker on their car, proud parent of an honor roll student. All right, they want to get the promotions at work. They want to show off their money. Maybe they get into extreme bodybuilding to show everybody how tough and what a great physique they have. They get advanced degrees and just keep going back and getting more and more and more degrees. They wear their veterans hats and have their veterans bumper stickers and want everybody to know that they were a veteran and they served the country and all this. 
They boast about their achievements. They post stuff on Facebook about how wonderful they are and how wonderful their children are and how what great things their kids have done. Why do you think there are people out there that do that? What's going on inside their head? They want to be praised and approved of. They want to get the commendation of men. And it could very well be because they didn't get it from their parents and specifically their father. So I say, parents, do not withhold praise from your children when they do well. When they do well. Now, there's going to be two parts to this section here that I'm talking about. There are, going to, there are some parents out there that withhold praise from their, from their sons and daughters, never praise them, and they need to be instructed that you need to praise those children when they do well. Now, there are going to be other parents out there that they don't need to hear this part at all. And as a matter of fact, I hope they plug their ears and don't hear it because they praise their kids way too much. Way too much. And I'll talk about that. That's the problem with preaching sermons. You have to be nuanced and you have to cover both sides. And here's the problem that I have found when I preach sermons. The people that don't need to hear it, hear it and feel all convicted about it. And the people that do need to hear it, pay no attention and think I'm talking to somebody else. It's happened to me so many times. And no, I don't really, I don't have anybody in this church in particular in mind when I'm talking about this praising your children kind of thing. I really don't. So, um, just take it. If, if, if you, if you don't do it enough, then start doing it. If you do it too much, then stop doing it so much. I'm, I'm not talking about anybody in particular. I'm serious. But children should be praised when they do well. I'll give you an example. And if you have a problem with this example, you've got major problems. Let me tell you what. Turn with me to Matthew 25 and verse 20. If you've got a problem with this father praising his children, you've got a problem. Matthew 25, 20 20 through 21. This is a parable of the kingdom of heaven. In the parable, the Lord here is the Lord of a servant, but the Lord here is the Lord. He's God, okay, in the parable. And what's he say? Verses 20 and 21. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. This is a parable of the Lord at the second coming after he's, he's given the talents and gifts unto men and then they're going to give an account of what they've done with them and the Lord says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. There is obviously nothing wrong with praising children who do well. God himself does it. And you know, God even praises his children when they do the best that they can with what they've been given even if they don't produce as good a results as others. Look at the rest of the parable here. Verses 22 through 23. He also that had received two talents. So the other, the other kid had five. This kid only has two. He doesn't have as much to work with. Maybe he's, he doesn't have, you know, the, the, the other brother had an IQ of 150. This guy's only got an IQ of 90, right? He just doesn't have the ability. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He gets the exact same blessing because he did the best he could with what he was given. See, God looks at proportionality. He doesn't look at overall results. He doesn't look at the quantity necessarily. He looks at what did you do with what you were given. Did you do the best you can with what you were given? And he's just as happy with the the one talent, the two talent, the five talent child as he is you know, with the others. So if God praises children for doing well, it is therefore good for parents to do the same to their children. Now there are some parents out there that just, they, they don't praise their children at all. They are nothing but critical of their children. Nothing but hard on their children. Nothing their children can do ever pleases them. There are parents out there like that, and it's very, very sad. And that will ruin a child. Ruin a child. And make a ruined adult of that child. 
Let me give you some other examples. Uh, rulers are supposed to praise people for doing good and doing well. Let's look at Romans 13 and verse 3. Romans 13 and verse 3. See, you can do good and not do well, or you can do well and not do good. You can do good by singing praises to God in church, but you might not do well at it. Case in point, you know, your pastor, he does good by singing praises to God in church. He doesn't do well at it, but he does good. It's a good thing to praise God, but he's not a good singer. You get what I'm saying? Or you could do well at any number of things, right? You could be the best bank robber in town, and you do well at bank robbing, but you're not doing good, right? Romans 13 and verse 3. Romans 13 and verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil... Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. You have praise of the powers. The powers are the government. right? That's the way it's supposed to work. Sadly, it doesn't work like that today at all. If you do well, you are demonized and probably have a lawsuit against you or something. Uh, or if you do good, I mean. If you do good, you're, you're not going to be praised. You know, like the poor cake baker out there in Colorado. He's been sued any number of times. I think he's going before the Supreme Court again. He went there because he wouldn't bake cakes for sodomites. Now he won't bake cakes for these transitioning, um, gender transitioning kids, you know, celebrating this, and now they're taking him to court again. So he does good and he's not praised to the same. That's not the way it's supposed to work, though. It's supposed to work when you do good, you get praised by the powers that be. And when you do evil, you get punished by them. That's what's supposed to happen. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 14. 1 Peter 2, 14. Peter's talking about how we're supposed to submit ourselves uh, to, the, to the powers, to the rulers, the kings, and so on. And then he says, verse 14, Or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So they're supposed to praise you when you do good and do well. Obviously, nothing wrong with that. This is what God has ordained. So if God's ordained it, that rulers praise people that do good and well, well, then obviously it's good that parents do the same thing. Parents are rulers of their children, are they not? Right? They have that same position of authority over them as rulers do. How about this example? Paul praised the church of Corinth because they remembered his teachings and kept the ordinances as he delivered them. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. <clears throat> Paul says, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Here's a man, a pastor, an apostle, that is praising a church for doing good, doing well. And this church was as, these, were, these people were as children unto the Apostle Paul. Let's just turn back to chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 15. He says, I write, on, I, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you, for though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul is relating to them as his children, in a spiritual sense. Not in a regeneration sense, but in a, in a conversion sense. Okay? And he praises them for doing well just like a father should praise his children. When his children do well, when they do a good job, when they work hard, when they're diligent, and especially when they do good, when they're godly and they obey the Bible and they keep God's commandments and they live godly lives, most especially, they ought to be praised for that. And fathers do a huge disservice when they will not praise their children for doing good and doing well. Another thing I want you to notice about Paul's praising of the Corinthians is that he praised them despite the fact that they were far from perfect. You ever read the, the epistle of 1 Corinthians? Far from perfect is an understatement. They had a fornicator in their midst that was having a sexual affair with his father's wife and they were tolerating it and even puffed up about it. They were, they were proud of themselves that they were so inclusive. 
and many, many other things. Read the epistle. They were pitting one minister against another one. They were taking each other to court instead of dealing with things in the church. They were, you know, 1 Corinthians 6. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. Um, they were they were really screwed up. They had so abused the Lord's Supper that some of them were sick and died because of it. They turned it into a drunken feast. I mean, this, this church was screwed up big time. And yet, he praised them when they did well. Parents should likewise praise their children when they do well, even if they do not always do well. This is important. A child can be a good child, even if he isn't always good. A parent can be a good parent, even if he or she isn't always good. Who is? What child is always good? What parent is always good? I don't know any. Don't feel like you can't tell somebody that he has done well just because he's not perfect or has flaws. If that's the case, you're never going to tell anybody that he's done well. Somebody doesn't have to be just perfect to say you've done a good job or you are a good such and such. I'm going to be careful about that. Now, praising people to some people comes very naturally. To other people, it doesn't come naturally. And some people that have very high standards, it's hard for them to praise somebody because all they can see is the flaws. All they can see is the thing that wasn't done. They don't see the ten things that were done well. They see the one thing that wasn't done well. And they just think, I can't say you've done a good job because there's that one thing. right? Now, if that one thing happens to be like a huge thing, and it's like, you know... 90% of the pie, and then the other nine things are little dinky things, I get that. I mean, if the one thing's huge, then yeah. But if, you know, nine out of ten of them are good, and there's one thing that wasn't done the best, you know, you don't need to be so hard on people. I mean, there is that principle, right, in Ezekiel, talking about the, the one thing being like the 90% of the pie, the, the man that does good his whole life and then does evil at the end of his life and none of his goodness will be remembered, only the evil, right? So there is that. Let me tell you what, if I serve this church for 40 years faithfully and when I'm 75 years old and I'm ready to, to kick off to the next life and you find out that I just had an affair with another woman, do you think you're going to say that was a good pastor? Nope. Doesn't matter if I spent 40 years and was the best pastor in the world, which of course I'm not, that one little thing, little, in quotes, means that I am not a good pastor, period. I might have been a good pastor, but I am not a good pastor, period, ever again. If fathers do not give their sons approval and praise, this is maybe not always true, but I think this is true a lot of the time, they will spend the rest of their lives trying to impress others to get the approval of their fathers. I've seen this happen. I could give you examples. I won't. But I have seen it happen. I guess you can never get in somebody's head and you can never know somebody's heart for sure. But I look at outwardly what is happening and I can say, yep, there's a guy that did not get the approval of his father. No doubt about it. And I can see by the way he's living that he is trying desperately to get the approval of everybody else that maybe his father will see everybody else ooing and aahing at him and maybe then his father will finally approve of him if I can just show everybody else my accomplishments. It happens. Believe me, I know it happens. Parents and especially fathers can damage their children for life by being overly critical of them and never praising them or showing their approval. Now, the caveat. Everything in moderation. You can praise your children too much. right? I was talking about not praising them enough. That's bad. But you can also do damage to them by praising them too much. Such children will grow up with a big ego and will be puffed up and full of themselves. And that happens, I think, a lot today. Because, you know, today, everybody's a winner. Everybody's wonderful. Everybody gets a prize. Right? Isn't that how they do it in school? Everybody gets a prize. 
Everybody gets praised. doesn't matter how well or how terrible you did. Everybody gets praised. That's also an error. As if I didn't need, as if I needed to tell you that. Some parents praise their children too much to other people. See, there are parents like this too. They won't praise their own children, but they will praise their children to other people. They will brag about their children to other people, but they won't tell their children that they've done a good job. But they'll tell other people. Why is that? Because you know what they're really doing? They are praising themselves. When they tell other people that my child was on the honor roll, my child's a star player, my child's this, my child's that, you know what they're really doing? They're saying, I'm awesome because my child did this and therefore I'm awesome. That's what it comes down to. It's usually an indirect way of praising themselves. My child is smart, therefore I'm smart. Right? My child is successful, therefore I'm successful. My child's a good athlete, therefore I'm a good athlete, or at least I would have been if I would have tried back when I you know, was in school. My child's wealthy, and therefore I'm wealthy too. I mean, that's how they look at it, right? They're living vicariously through their children. There are a lot of parents that do that. Their boasting of their children really is only about themselves. It's really not about the children. Now, as parents, you want to be sure, and as, as Christians in general, you want to be sure to praise good character, diligence, hard work, good work ethic, godly behavior, those kind of things. You want to be sure to praise those things rather than inborn traits such as beauty and physical characteristics. That is foolish to praise a, your daughter because she's beautiful. What did your daughter do to become beautiful? Nothing. Nothing. Right? To praise your son because he's six foot tall and has a really awesome body. What did he do to get that? Probably nothing. You don't praise, you shouldn't, praise inborn characteristics. And I was going to find you a verse, I just thought about it this morning, and I was out of time and I couldn't remember it. But Paul said, What hast thou that thou didst not receive? And if thou received it, why dost thou boast? It's in, I think it's in, Corinthians somewhere. I can't remember. But anyway, you know the, you might know the verse I'm talking about. He's saying, why would you boast about something you received? Right? If you've been blessed with something, it's been given to you, why would you boast? Right? Imagine if when Bev gave us our car, imagine if Bev would have been a woman of wealth and she gave us a Bentley, and then for the next several years I drove around saying, look at me, I'm driving a Bentley, aren't I awesome? And somebody's like, well, some old lady gave that to you, what makes you so awesome, Right? But I got a verse for you. Proverbs 31, 28 through 30. Proverbs 31, 28 through 30. This is talking about the virtuous woman. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. What's he praising her for? Because she's beautiful? No, he's praising her because she's done virtuously. No, of course, I think men should tell their wives they're pretty. I mean, of course, women like to hear that. That's, a, that's not a bad thing. But for, for, for parents to praise their children, just lavish it on them and tell their children from a young age how beautiful they are, you're setting that girl up for major trouble. Major trouble. But let's continue reading. Favor is deceitful. That's a woman with favorable characteristics. You can compare that with Scripture. You can see that uh, Rachel found favor in Jacob's eyes and so on. And beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. See, you praise a woman that fears the Lord, not the woman just because she's beauty, beautiful. Same goes with your children. A child should be commended according to his wisdom far more than for his athletic abilities or even his academic successes. Let's look at Proverbs 12 and verse 8. Proverbs 12 and verse 8.
as a man shall be commended according to his wisdom, but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. So if you're going to commend your children for something, commend them for wisdom. If you commend them and praise them for athletic abilities or even academic success, you know what you're going to get more of? You're going to get more of that. Whatever you praise, you're going to get more of. So if you praise your, your son or daughter for their athletic abilities and you're just an awesome athlete, you're so good at this, blah, 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 blah. You know what you're going to get? More and more of that and less and less of everything else. If you praise your son, even for academic success, you're so smart. Oh, you got straight A's again. That's awesome. And that's good, right? You're going to get more and more of that, but you're going to get less time spent on other things. But on the other hand, if you praise your son and commend your son or your daughter for wisdom, you made a good decision. I am, I am very pleased with you that you made a good decision. You made a hard decision, right? You've been smart with your money. You've done well saving your money. That's a great, that's a, you're, you are off to a good start in life. Giving to the Lord, that, you're off to a good start in life, right? You're wise. I am very thankful that you have made good decisions. I'm, I praise you because you've kept God's commandments, because you read your Bible every day, because you pray, because you want to do the right thing, because you're concerned about what God thinks, and you want to follow Him. You want to be baptized. You want to join the church. You want to follow Him in spirit, worship Him in spirit and in truth. Those are the kinds of things that if you praise, you'll get more of. The more you praise all the other worldly things, you'll get more of that, and you're going to get less, because all of us only have so much time in a day. And if you spend it doing the worldly pursuits, you're going to spend less time in spiritual things. This should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. Bad behavior should not be praised. Uh, sadly, I, I, I think that happens plenty. Bad behavior gets praised. You throw a fit in the store because you want something. And guess what happens? Instead of getting your butt beat, you get rewarded for it by getting the thing you threw a fit for. You ever seen that happen? I'm sure you have. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 22. 17 and 22. 1 Corinthians 11, 17 and 22. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. See, he's not, he's not praising them for what they've done with the Lord's Supper and, and turned it into a drunken potluck. Verse 22, he says, What, have you not homes to eat in, to eat and drink in, or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? Shall I praise you, or sh what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. See, Paul was not about to praise people for doing evil for not doing well now we should try to remember to praise and compliment people when they do good all right and that's the key when they do good we should approve of things that are excellent the scripture tells us in philippians 1 and verse 10 philippians 1 and verse 10 says that ye approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense in the day of Christ. Don't approve things that are reprehensible. Don't approve things that are contrary to God's law. If you have a son or daughter and they grow up and shack up with their girlfriend, you don't approve of that. You say, absolutely, I will not approve of that. And if you come over to my house to stay the night, you're not staying in the same room. You're staying in separate rooms. I don't care how old you are. You're staying in separate rooms. I don't care if you've got four kids and you've been living together for 10 years. You come to my house, you're staying in separate rooms because you are fornicators. You prove the things that are excellent, not things that are reprehensible. We should not approve of things or praise things which are not good. See, charity rejoices in the truth, not in error or iniquity. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 6. 'Cause when you condone something, you're approving of it. 
If you have two, you got two young people come over to your house and you, and they're not married and you allow them to stay in the same bedroom, you are condoning their fornication. You are approving of their fornication. Whether you say you are or not, it doesn't matter. You are approving of it. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 6. Says, rejoice. This is talking about charity. Charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. See, if someone has accomplished something that he or she should not have done, in other words, that is not biblical, I cannot commend him or her for it, no matter how much work was involved, no matter how successful the person was, no matter how many years they devoted to it. If it is not biblical, I'm sorry, I can't commend it. I can't approve of it. I can't praise it. I can't say I'm happy for you. I can't say congratulations. I can't do it. Because charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. And it doesn't matter if it was my own children or not. Sorry. Now, praising good work does not mean flattering people. There's a big difference between praise and flattery. And if you can't sincerely praise somebody... And you do it anyway, you know what you've done? You flattered them. That's the definition of flattery, is insincere praise. I'll give you the definition here uh, in just a second. Let's look at some verses, though. Proverbs 26 and verse 28. Proverbs 26, 28. Let's see here, that's uh, 28, 28, 26, 28. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Flattery is the action or practice of flattering, false or insincere praise, adulation, cajolery, blandishment. To flatter, primarily, uh, this is interesting, of an animal, bird, etc., is to show delight or fondness by wagging the tail, making a caressing sound, etc., so, in the primary sense, when you walk in the door and your dog meets you and he's wagging his tail and he's all excited, he's flattering you. Okay? When you walk in the door and you meet your cat and she starts purring and rubbing up against your leg, she's only getting what she wants and then she's going to ditch you like a bad habit in about two seconds. Right? That's flattery in both cases. But that's not what we're talking about here. Secondly, it's to try to please or win the favor of a person by obsequious speech or conduct, to court, fawn upon, to praise or compliment unduly or insincerely. So that's what it is to flatter. So either you're just heaping praise on somebody, undue amounts of praise, and just singing this person's praise. Like, they, they, they're just... What you're saying about them is just ridiculous. I mean, they're just clearly not that great. They're, they clearly didn't accomplish something that marvelous. Or you're just flat out lying and just insincerely telling them, hey, you did a good job when you're thinking that was a terrible job. Or you look really nice in that dress today and you're thinking you look horrible in that dress today or whatever. You know, that kind of thing. That's, that's flattery. Proverbs 29 and verse 5. I've got a couple of more here for you. Proverbs 29 and verse 5. <clears throat> a man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. That's why you want, to, you want to refine your praise. When you start hearing somebody praise you, if, if he's telling you things that, that make you sound a lot better than you are, then he might just be spreading a net for your feet. He's trying to catch you in some kind of a trap because... You know, once you butter somebody up and get on their good side by telling them how wonderful they are, then you can usually start to get him or her to do whatever you want uh, for you. Got to watch out for that. If your boss comes up to you and just starts telling you what a wonderful employee you are and how great you've done and how he wouldn't, he don't know what he would do without you, and and you better be ready for him to ask you to work ten hours of overtime next week, right? Or something. Something's going on there, probably. First uh, Corinthians. Now, 1 Thessalonians, pardon me, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 5. 1 Thessalonians 2, 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. See how flattery and covetousness go along together? Use flattering words, and then you can get out of somebody what you really want. So we must steer between the errors of flattery, 
on one hand, and withholding praise and commendation from somebody that it's due to on the other. Right? So you don't want to give insincere praise, and you don't want to hold back praise that is due either. You want to, you got to, you, know, you got to make a balance there. Now here's one that you want to be really careful about. You never want to let envy, jealousy, or pride keep you from praising the good works of somebody else. And this often is what stops somebody from praising somebody else. It's envy, jealousy, or pride. Either they think that other person in their heart is better than them and they really want to be as good as that person so you don't dare praise somebody that you think is better than you and you want to be better than or you have this high opinion of yourself which is pride you know and you just can't bring yourself to praise anybody else because to praise them then doesn't make me look as good this is what happened with Saul and David you remember when after David slew Goliath and then he became Saul's right-hand man, and, and David would go out to battle, and he would do the, <clears throat> he would conduct the battles of the Lord, and he was very successful in it. And then Saul and David came back from a battle one time, and all the women were just hysterical about David, and they were praising Saul a little bit, but praising uh, David a lot more. And, and this made Saul envious, and it ended up being the rottenness of his bones and his destruction. Uh, first, First Samuel eighteen seven through nine. 1 Samuel 18, 7 through 9. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and then the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. See, Saul envied David. That just really stuck in his cry. He hated that when they said that David slain his ten thousands. Now, if I was the king, I'd say, sweet, I got a good general. He can go out there and fight the battles, and I'll stay at home in the kingdom and just oversee things, right? Uh, but that's not, what, that's not the way that Saul thought. So Saul became very envious of him, and then an evil. The Lord took the, the Holy Spirit from him and gave him an evil spirit, and then Saul just became a paranoid murderer, attempted murderer for the rest of his life. It was a horrible thing. It was all because of envy. Look at Proverbs 14 and verse 30. Proverbs 14 and verse 30. How much praising of David do you think Saul was doing? None, right? Because he envied him. Uh, Proverbs 14, 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. It'll destroy you. It'll destroy your health. It'll eat you up from the inside out. It's a terrible thing. <clears throat> envy, the noun, is malignant or hostile feeling, ill will, malice, enmity. The feeling, or, the feeling of mortification and ill will occasioned by the contemplation of superior advantages possessed by another. The verb envy, like to envy, is to feel displeasure and ill will at the superiority of another person in happiness, success, reputation, or the possession of anything desirable. To regard with discontent another's possession of some superior advantage which one would like to have for oneself. Also in less unfavorable sense, to wish oneself on a level with another in happiness or in the possession of something desirable, to wish oneself possessed of something which another has. That's the less unfavorable sense. That's the way, that's more like covetousness where you just wish you had what somebody else has. But envy is that you hate the person because they have what you don't have. Right? So there's a, there's a, a level of hatred and malevolence that goes along with the covetousness and that is what envy is. And that is the rottenness of the bones. That is something that you can't stand before. That you, you're, you're in a dangerous situation when you have an enemy that envies you. Uh, Proverbs 27 and verse 4 says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who can stand before envy? See, the wrath and the anger are cruel and outrageous. They're dangerous. You get somebody that's full of wrath and he can, I mean, he could just fly off the handle and attack you or kill you or who knows what or at least just scream at you and go into a rage. And that's bad and that's dangerous. But envy's even worse. 
Because envy is going on inside here, and you don't know that this guy hates you. When he's pounded on your head, you know that he hates you, and you know that you got to get away. But when he hates you in his heart, and you don't realize it, you don't know it, that's a lot more dangerous. And sometimes this, this happens. When you do well, if you work hard, and you do well, and you're wise, some people will praise you for it, and other people will hate you for it. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 4. Solomon said, Again, I considered all travail and every right work, that for this, every right work, okay, doing the right thing, fearing God, keeping His commandments, you know, being a good Christian, a good citizen, a good worker, every right work, that for this, a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. What happens to the nerd in school who studies hard and works hard and gets better grades than everybody else? Do the other students praise him and, and commend him? No, they hate him, right? And it works that way in, in life too. What happens to the employee that just works hard, isn't on his cell phone, goofing around all day, is just diligent and does exactly what the boss asks for and is just a great all-around employee? Do the other employees praise him or do they hate him and wish that he would get fired because he makes them look bad? And maybe even try to get him fired. Right? For every right work, a man is envied of his neighbor. And this is vanity and vexation of spirit. It can cause you a lot of angst whenever that is the result. After you've done, worked hard and done the best you could and then you're envied and hated for it. Our Lord Jesus Christ knew all about it. Uh, look at James 4, 6 through 7. This is what happens with an envious person. See, now, a, a person with a good heart, he sees somebody doing well, it, doing better than himself. He sees an, a, a fellow employee that's just an all-star employee. This guy's great. He doesn't hate him for it. He's, he, he's thankful for it. He praises him for it. He's happy for him. James 4, 5 through 6. This is a problem we all, we all uh, have to deal with. He says, Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? You see, this is our natural state. We have a spirit that lusts to envy. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You see, this is what we have to fight against. By God's grace and by God's help, we can overcome these things. But our natural state is, when we see somebody else doing well, we don't like it. And we don't like them for it. You don't ever want to let that stop you from praising somebody. See, having a high opinion of yourself, which is pride, and feeling displeasure or ill will at the success of another, that's envy, is what stops men from praising and commending others when they do well. Now, as I was thinking about this, if you take a proud man or an envious man, he will likely praise two different types of people and withhold it from a third. Okay? He will praise men who are, first of all, clearly above him and out of his league. Okay, so let me just give you a simple example. You got a high school baseball player, and he's a good baseball player. He's full of himself, he's proud, you know, he's he's he would hate the fact if anybody else is better than him. But he could praise a professional baseball player, right? Um, I don't even know any because I don't follow baseball anymore. But Andy Van Slyke, that was my favorite. You don't even probably know who he is. He was a baseball player for the Pirates when I was a kid when I used to watch baseball. But anyway, or whatever. Uh, Barry Bonds, you know who he is? I don't know. Anyway, maybe. Uh, whatever. So I just, I'm naming like 30 years ago because that's the only thing I know. But um, Mickey Mantle, you ever heard of him? You know? Honus Wagner, how about that? Um, <laughs> but anyway, Babe Ruth, there you go. Maybe you heard of him. But um, anyway, this high school boy. He would have no problem praising Babe Ruth and say, man, that guy was awesome, great Bambino, he could hit home runs, he could just call it, you know, point him out and whatever. He'd have no problem praising Babe Ruth because, I mean, he is literally out of his league, right? So he's no threat to him whatsoever, right? And then this, this proud fool could also praise people who are way beneath him and inferior to him. You know, the kid on the t-ball league and... You know, he's just, he's not even a good player, and he manages to, to somehow hit the ball and it dribbles five feet and he runs to first base. He could praise him and say, that was a great hit, right? He's no threat to him whatsoever, 
right? He's not going to take any of his fame. He's not going to take any of his, his approval and praise or whatever. But you take a guy that's his equal, that's about as good as he is on his team maybe, maybe a little better, maybe a little worse, he won't praise him because that's going to take the praise away from him, right? He can praise the guy that's way out of his league and he can praise the guy that's, that's lousy, but he won't praise anybody that's anywhere near him because we've got to make sure all the attention is on me. That's how that works. Now, I want to close with an exhortation to rejoice with them that do rejoice and be happy, be genuinely happy for those who experience success. Let's look at some verses here. Romans 12 and verse 15. Romans 12, 15. It says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So if, and this is especially applicable in the church, this is written to a church, but we should, you know, when possible, Paul goes on to say, we should uh, live, live peaceably with all men. I mean, we should treat all men like this if we can.